Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our next show, and we have a very honored speaker today. And uh, uh, two years ago, connected for the first time with Jocko, and um, my world has changed ever since then. But most importantly, one of the reasons we invited Jocko in today is one is you know over our conference over the last few days. <clears throat> One of the things we talked about was our history, SF history, because we're not good at capturing it, and we're not good at keeping it where others can get to it. And so as we move forward, one of the new avenues are podcasts. And two and a half, three years ago, a couple friends of mine, and my wife goes, there's these great podcasts with Jordan Peterson. There's this Navy SEAL down in San Diego. You got to go meet this guy. <laughs> so, of course, yeah. So we tried to reach out to the website the normal ways. And a couple of friends of mine said the same thing. So long story short, we met with Jocko. We did a podcast. And now I'm getting Instagrams from around the world, people who now listen to podcasts because it's difficult to get accurate history. And... We invited Jocko, he's kind enough to come in today. Later this week is one of his major events, it's called the Muster, which is a leadership training program. He's in town for that, but he took time to come uh, spend an hour with us today. And um, he had two tours of duty in Iraq. The second tour of duty was retaking of Ramadi. He was the OIC for Task Force Bruiser. They lost good men, and there are podcasts now over 300 podcasts that if you just Google Jocko Willink, each podcast is listed. One of my favorites is number 15, where as an English major, Jocko goes in and talks about King Henry V by Shakespeare. And my favorite part of that, Jocko, was when he comes in and says, every actor who ever portrayed Henry V got it wrong. And he goes through some there's major actors that have done that, and then he goes on to explain why. And it's not all just military podcasts. If you go to 219, where he interviewed Mrs. Schindler, a woman who wrote about living in her Polish village a few years before World War II, how the village changed to hate Jews, and how that hatred went on and grew for her family, ultimately her entire family ended up in concentration camps. She lost relatives, I believe parents. And that interview was one of the most compelling of all time, in my humble opinion. And then two episodes later, Johnny, uh, Johnny Kim. Johnny Kim was uh, a corpsman with Jocko during the retaking of Ramadi. And it's just incredible storytelling about what they went through there but more importantly, how after that tour of duty, he goes to medical school. And that history is unraveled there about another one of our SEALs and uh, officer, or just a regular, he's just an enlisted guy. He goes to Harvard Medical School, graduates with honors, another medical school, and then today he's an astronaut. <laughs> so these are some of the amazing stories. And of course, we have Dick Thompson, who's not here, but episode number 205 where Dick Thompson talked about a mission going out of CCN. And after I heard it, I felt like a wimp. So with that, I want to introduce Jocko Willink. Please welcome him. And then after, and after we're done, uh, we will stand by for a few photos, because I know other people, he's been very good about getting together with us. So Jocko, turn it over to you, sir. Thank you. It's, it's actually pretty funny to be here talking, and it's an honor to be here talking because, you know, my whole life I wanted to be some kind of soldier, wanted to be some kind of commando, and I, I also grew up in the water, so as soon as I figured out what the SEALs were and that they operated in the water, I decided that would be the best route for me, and so this was now 1989 when I enlisted. I didn't actually leave until 1990 and missed the first Gulf War. I was still going through training when the first Gulf War happened. But, but what, the reason I said it was kind of funny for me to be sitting here talking to you all is because 
When I got done with SEAL training and went to SEAL Team 1, in my mind, I was 19 years old, I thought I was going to Nam. <laughs> That's what I thought. My whole life, I grew up listening to Vietnam stories, reading everything I could read about Vietnam, and I just thought to myself, hey, it's SEAL Team 1, SEAL Team 1 has this great history in, in Vietnam, and that must be, there must be a secret war going on somewhere in Southeast Asia, and I'm going to go be a part of it. Well, I was completely wrong. <laughs> and when I showed up to the SEAL teams in the 90s, there was nothing going on. Um, I did a bunch of workups and trained and went on deployment. When we would go on deployment, all we would do is go out and teach, you know, shooting to host nations. Ended up moving through the ranks, you know, as it started off as an enlisted guy, eventually got picked up for a commissioning program, became an officer, which, um, please don't hold it against me. I know Tilt does. <laughs> and, and went out to SEAL Team 2, from SEAL Team 1 to SEAL Team 2. Did a couple deployments out at SEAL Team 2. Again, the real missions. I finally did my first real missions when I was at SEAL Team 2. What we were doing was something called VBSS. It's taking down ships. And we thought that was pretty cool at the time. It's really just nothing at all. But that, that was a real mission for us. We got to lock and load our weapons, so we thought that was pretty cool. Uh, got done with that. Ended up going to college. In order to be an officer in the military, you have to go to college. I hadn't been to college yet, so the Navy sent me to college. And during college is when September 11th happened. When September 11th happened, got done with college, went back to SEAL Team, went to SEAL Team 7. And SEAL Team 7 was, was in the chamber to go on deployment to Iraq. I showed up there, and three months, four months later, deployed to Iraq. I was a SEAL platoon commander. And what we were doing was direct action missions, so capture kill missions. Most of the time it was capture because we would surprise these guys so, so handily that they wouldn't have any time to defend themselves. We'd get intel from various sources. We'd load up our vehicles. Two o'clock in the morning was usually what we try for, for like a time on target. We'd load up our vehicles, stop our vehicles a couple blocks away because the, the Humvees make a bunch of noise. So we'd stop a couple blocks away, we'd dismount the vehicles, we'd foot patrol up to the buildings, wherever the bad guy was located. Just about every house in Iraq has like a, a six to eight foot wall around it. So we'd built these little two by four ladders that we would put up against the walls, climb over, climb inside the compounds, put explosive breaching charges on the doors, blast the doors open, and then go in, grab the bad guys. We'd take the bad guys back to our base, we'd interrogate them, we'd find out where their friends were, and of course, we'd go get their friends, <laughs> which was awesome. <laughs> just, a, just a great experience, that's what I wanted to do my whole life. And it was also, we had a real tactical advantage over the enemy, they were kind of just a bunch of thugs running around, they were not very well trained, they, they just didn't know what they were doing. Former criminals, some regime elements. And then we got done with that deployment and kind of, I mean, I thought the war was over. I thought I was lucky that I got to deploy. And we kind of high-fived after that deployment, came back to America. And we're watching what's happening in Iraq. This is now 2004. When I deployed in 2003, get home in 2004. And it seemed like the war was going to end pretty quick. And as soon as we got back, we're watching the news and paying attention to what's happening. And that's when we started to hear this new word being used to describe what was happening in Iraq, and that word was insurgency. And so these former thugs that had been running around causing problems, they all of a sudden got financing, they got direction, and they got leadership. They got leaders coming in from foreign countries Al-Qaeda leadership started, came in and started running operations with them. And things just continued to get worse and worse and worse. So when I came home from that first deployment where I was in charge of two SEAL platoons, I came home from that deployment and got put in charge of a task unit, which for us is two platoons. Got through the workup, ready to go on deployment. About two weeks before we were going to deploy to Baghdad, we were going to be working with the Iraqi counterterrorism force in Baghdad. And two weeks before we went on deployment, that order got changed 
and we ended up getting sent to Al Ambar province, the capital of Al Ambar province, which was the city of Ramadi, which at the time in 2006 was the worst part of Iraq. We deployed there, and when we got on the ground, there was, there was Americans getting wounded or killed every day. It was a really tough fight. Uh, my immediate attitude was, how can we help out the conventional forces that were, that were taking the fight to the enemy? How can we do, do our best to support them? And what we eventually figured out was one of the best ways we could support them was by setting up what we called, what we called overwatch positions, sniper overwatch positions. And so we'd go out in the city and when the conventional forces were doing operations, clearance operations, I'd usually put some guys on the clearance operation, but then I'd put some guys in, like I said, what we called sniper overwatch positions. And in those sniper overwatch positions, as the enemy would maneuver in to attack the, the forces on the ground, our snipers would just, would just kill them. And it was very, very effective. They didn't know where we were most of the time for at least the first few hours of the day. Once we started taking shots, they would figure out where, where we were and they would, they would usually attack our positions. So the sniper, I, a lot of times, traditionally when people think of sniper missions, they think of like two guys going out. These sniper missions, we'd have 10 guys or 15 guys or 20 guys to take down a building and secure the building and let the snipers go to work. So not really the traditional idea of the way snipers are thought of, but I was lucky enough I had 13 trained snipers in that, in that task unit and we put them to good work. If you've heard of the, the SEAL Chris Kyle, the uh, American sniper, he was, he was the, the lead sniper and the point man. In, in one of those two platoons, Charlie platoon, and then his counterpart in the other platoon. They, they both did a, a lot of good work, and, and so did all the snipers and the rest of the guys that were out there with them. Um, but the, the, the majority of the credit goes to the conventional forces that were there. Those guys were taking significant casualties every day, and they were doing an incredible job fighting. And it was very humbling to be able to support those guys in the, in the Army and the Marine Corps and, and see the work that they did and see the sacrifices that they made and uh, we became incredibly, we formed an incredible bond with the Army and with the Marine Corps. In fact, um, the, the brigade commander there, Colonel Sean McFarland, who's now General McFarland, he, he took to calling us his Army SEALs, and, and we took a lot of pride in that. Um, working alongside the Army, the, also the first, the 506, we worked alongside of them. We were, we were basically embedded with them for most of that deployment, or I had a, an element of guys that were embedded with the first of the 506 for, for almost that entire deployment. Again, the, the bond that we have with, uh, with the Army and the Marine Corps is just unbreakable, and we won't forget the, uh, the sacrifices that they made. You know, when it was my guys in the field under the threat of being overrun by the enemy, it was these soldiers and these Marines that would load up their tanks and, and drive to the positions of my guys and get them out of there. So it was an incredible experience for me. Um, ended up being more like World War II than like Vietnam because we had tanks. Uh, the, the air support really didn't work out very well, the, at least not for helicopters because the, the, the city was so bad that when helicopters would come in, they would just get too shot up. So most of the, most of the fire support that we got was from tanks and Bradleys. It was a different environment, urban environment. Um, we did have one area, one AO, that was, that was uh, northeast of downtown Ramadi. And <laughs> it looked like Vietnam. They had rice paddies out there. They had big palm trees. We, and we, we had the Marine Corps Hueys flying around and Cobras. And we called that, it was called, uh, we, what we called it was Viet Ram because it was Ramadi, but it looked like Vietnam to us. So when I got home from that deployment, uh, that's when I took over the training for the West Coast SEALs. And, and the training that I took over was the, the advanced training, not the training that you know, guys carry boats around and carrying logs on their head. That's not the training I took over. I took over the advanced training, the, the pre-deployment training for SEAL platoons that are getting ready to deploy to Iraq and Afghanistan. And the reason I did that is because from my deployment, where as Tilt mentioned, you know, we, we took a lot of casualties and lost some incredible guys, and I just wanted to make sure that the lessons we learned 
got passed directly on to the guys that were ready to deploy. That, that was my goal, was to make sure that those lessons got pack, passed on. And so I took over that training for the West Coast SEAL teams. And that's what, I, that's what I focused on, was putting these guys in simulated combat scenarios that would be, my goal was to make them worse than they would see on the battlefield. The horrendous situations, we use paintball, we use this high speed laser tag system. We had special effects people. I had Hollywood people come down and make our, like set designers, make our, our training areas look like they were cities in Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, we had bombs going off. We had, I hired actors and actresses. So we'd have, you know, Arabic speaking women coming out of buildings. We'd have guys blown up on the ground with no leg and blood spraying everywhere. They'd be an amputee actor. We, we went through great lengths to get these guys trained up so that they were ready for the, for the stress and the confusion and the leadership portion of being on the battlefield. And I did that for my last few years that I was, that I was in the Navy. And then at, at 20 years, I retired. Uh, when I retired, you know, I, I started working with companies doing the same thing, basically talking about leadership and teaching leadership. And that ended up, uh, I ended up writing some books about leadership and then this podcast that Tilt's talking about, you know, at, podcasting was sort of starting when I, when I started my podcast. It hadn't been around for that long. And for me, it was just an opportunity primarily to talk about, again, some of the lessons that I learned in combat, some of the lessons I learned throughout my career in the Navy. And I just wanted as many people to hear those lessons as I could. And the other key component of this was I wanted to talk about history uh, and specifically combat history and the incredible sacrifices that have been made by American forces since we've been a nation. And, and just going back and digging into those lessons and reading those books, and that's what the, that's what the podcast became. Is for, I know it sounds weird, but most of the time it's me sitting around reading a book, which sounds strange. But uh, then along the way, I started, I started getting in contact with people that had served and that had experiences and started bringing people on and capturing those stories, which has been a huge honor for me. And eventually, uh, we, I got in, got in touch with Tilt. And, and for me, you know, we had, I'd heard about SOG, of course, because in the SEAL teams, we would get, we'd get bits and pieces of these stories of SOG. I knew that there were some SEALs in SOG. I knew it was mostly Army. You know, I'd hear about the Phoenix program. We had, I had some, when I came in, there were some Vietnam guys that were in the Phoenix program, so we'd kind of talk to them a little bit. But you still never got really good debriefs and really couldn't capture the lessons learned. And I think one of the best examples of that is, you know, uh, Mike Thornton, who's a, a Medal of Honor recipient from the SEAL teams, from SEAL Team One. And I went through my whole Navy career, 20 years, and I actually knew him and I had met him. And when, when one of my guys, Mike Monsoor received the Medal of Honor posthumously. I, I, I became friends with, with Mike Thornton because he was a Medal of Honor recipient. And even through the rest of my time in the Navy, I never really knew exactly what he did. Sure, I read the, the Medal of Honor citation for Mike Thornton and, and understood sort of the, the mechanics of what had happened, but I didn't know, I didn't get a full debrief the way I would debrief one of my teammates if I went on a mission and things went sideways and, that, and I wanted to pass on the lessons, I never got anything like that. It wasn't until he came on my podcast and went line by line through everything that he had been through on that one operation and through the rest of his career to really capture those lessons learned. So the lessons that, you know, that, that we're getting from SOG right now, it may seem, a lot of this stuff might seem, it might seem like common sense to, to you guys. Some of these lessons, they might seem like common sense. I can tell you, and, and this was the first chapter in the first book that I wrote, was about a, a fratricide that we had, that I was in charge of the operation, we had a fratricide. Had, a, had a, one of my SEALs shot and killed a friendly Iraqi soldier. And then the Iraqi soldiers attacked my Overwatch element. I had one of my guys get wounded there. They wounded more of those Iraqis. It was a terrible situation. I mean, in my mind, there's nothing worse than, than a blue on blue. There's nothing worse than fratricide. And here I was in charge of an operation and a fratricide takes place. 
and there was total confusion. I had four elements out on the battlefield, myself included. All of us were in gunfights. And the fog of war, all those things that you would hear about, we, they happened. And so that was another reason why I wanted to take over training. I wanted to make sure that that, that type of thing didn't happen again. And you know, there was, a, there was a fracture side at SEAL Team 1 in Vietnam, which I had heard about. I knew about it. It took place with a, a, a platoon called X-Ray Platoon. And there was confusion. They got split up. They shot and killed one of their own men. But I never got a detailed brief of exactly how that happened and exactly how you prevent that kind of thing from happening. And that's wrong. So to capture these lessons, in fact, it's funny, I was talking to Tilt and he's telling me about one operation. He goes, yeah, so then we split forces. And I said, hey, Tilt, I said, I, I always tell my guys, don't split forces. It always it ends up going bad. I mean, unless you really have to, if you can avoid it, try not to split forces. And he says, yeah, that was the only time I ever split forces and I never did it again. <laughs> so these lessons that, that, that we're capturing right now from you all is, it's just, it's so important. Because like I said, they may seem obvious to, to you, but, but, but there are things that if people haven't been in combat, they, they can miss them. So it's been an honor for me to, to talk to guys from SOG, to talk, from, to, to, talk to not only Americans, but I've had a, a, a couple Vietnamese on there. That was just incredible to, to hear their stories. Um, capturing the Frenchman before the Frenchman passed away. I mean, what an honor that was. So uh, this whole thing has just been an honor for me. And I, I, I feel very lucky to be a part of it. It's an honor for me to come and talk to you all today. And uh, with that, if you guys have any questions for me, then let's hear them. Before we do, I, I just, I've been negligent again. I failed to mention that Jocko, we're, we're calling it Jocko Productions now, amongst the many businesses that he has up and running besides leadership, he is financing our interviews that we're calling SOGCAST. They're now posted on Apple, they're on Spotify, and right now they're the podcast, the audio, he's paying for all of our guys to come out. Mike Taylor, uh, Jim Shorten, the troll, all of our guys. And over time, we're doing these interviews and the podcast run anywhere from one to three hours, depending on the interview. Some like Spider Parks gets kind of bashful. He goes, we've been talking for a long time. It's only an hour and a half. Jocko's things go two, three, four hours. But... He is doing that on his own, and he's encouraging me. And during this, uh, our, our time here, we had three of our men that I was able to interview. Jocko sent out Kerry Helton, one of his new uh, hires, who's a technician, former Marine. And this is a kind of effort. When he talks about the history, and yes, he interviewed uh, Captain On, who was honored with our, at the SOA convention, and Cowboy. Uh, Cowboy was 258, On was 259, Jocko Podcast, which are just, to me, very moving and very really, because Cowboy was with Lynn Black on that mission. But this is you. We can go into the Q&A. You can handle yourself. If you got any questions, throw them up here now. Talk to Jocko. And then um, for he's agreed to hang on to get a few individual pictures, if you like, before we all leave and just give us an opportunity afterwards. And then he's going back to work. Because this weekend on uh, 28th and 29th, his, his muster is a leadership thing. And there are people across our country that buy into this because they're looking for a leadership that comes from Jocko, his crew, and the military. There's lessons that we've learned we take for granted. Civilians don't know. Back to you, but I wanted to give you that final little uh, thank you, sir, for all that returning of our history. Yeah, So, and just so you all know, the, 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 I have several hundred episodes, I guess over 300 episodes, and people come up to me all the time, and they always say, hey, thanks for getting the SOG guys on there. We want to hear more SOG guys. And that's why, you know, Tilt was hitting me up saying, hey, I got this guy you can interview. I got this guy you can interview. I got this guy you can interview. And I said, cool, I got a job. <laughs> and I said, hey, how about I buy you a recorder, and you go interview all these guys besides your SOG, and that's a great, that's a, you know, people are going to want to hear from you more. So uh, 
like that, that whole thing with the SOGCAST, you know, I've, I've had multiple Medal of Honor recipients on, on my podcast, and um, I had a guy named Dakota Meyer, who's a Marine Medal of Honor recipient, and, and I remember just thinking to myself, imagine if you could hear a four-hour conversation with John Bazalone, right? I mean, this is, it's just, it's just amazing opportunity and an honor to be able to talk to somebody like Dakota Meyer, who, who, who Medal of Honor recipient in Afghanistan, and hear every detail of this story and understand what he was like as a person. This is, this is something that people will be listening to. Like I said, we still, we still cherish the memory of John Bazalone, but it, wouldn't it be incredible if we had two, three, four hours, five hours of him talking and explaining these things and his lessons learned and his attitude. So to be able to, to, to capture these stories, and especially from SOG, because your stories never got out. They never got out. You know, when I was in, when I fought in the Battle of Ramadi, it was wide open. It was happening on, it was on the news. There was nothing secret about it. Well, there was something secret about it, but there was basically nothing secret about it. It was us fighting a bunch of Mujahideen fighters in the streets. There's nothing classified about that. There's tanks blowing up buildings. That's not, that's not classified. But for what you guys did, it was classified for so long. And to be able to get that and get that story out there so people understand the sacrifices that were made, it's, to me, it's, the, it's, the, it's the, the least I can do. Since, you know, as a modern special operations guy, my whole existence, my whole life, is on the shoulders of what you guys did, the reputation that you earned. That's my, been my whole life. You know, the first, I didn't shoot my weapon at the enemy for thir my, the first 13 years I was in the Navy. We were just riding on the coattails of what you guys did in Vietnam as special operations. So the least I can do is try and capture those stories and, and share them with as many people as I can. And you should know, like I said, that people absolutely uh, want to hear these stories and, and they have the, the highest level of respect. Uh, Doc, are you, are you putting, setting it up as an archive so anybody can get into it from any means of communication so they can, they can go out to the kids now in this country, uh, a teacher can pull them up inside her classroom if it's pertinent for her lesson. Yep, so, so the question was, am I getting this stuff out in, the, in, a, in a broad way? And the answer is yes. A any human being that has a phone in the world and internet can have access to all these things right now. And I'll, I'll tell you what's awesome, I, I spoke at West Point a while back, and when I went to West Point, I'm, I went to go meet the colonel who was in charge of leadership at West Point. And I, I sat down, started talking with him, and he brought up one particular incident. And I said, oh, you know, sir, I, I did a podcast on that. And he goes, yeah, that's where I got this from. He said, I play your podcast in, in class all the time. So the, the information is readily available to anybody that has a phone, a computer, some access to the internet, they can watch them for free. So we're, we're just trying to get as much information out there as we can. In the back. Yes. Hey, Doc, I just want to thank you for uh, all the things you put out there. Uh, I follow your uh, Facebook posts, and I just want to thank you for sharing with your posts. Uh, I feel like a warm sense of community right now. It's hard for me because uh, there's a couple of parts of your advocate analysis that says that you don't feel that our Constitution is like warm and sharing with society. On the military side, it also kind of feels so warm and sharing with society. I'm just really curious. Well, thank you. I mean, that, that's awesome that you're, you're, you're reaching out to people, get, getting them jobs, getting them a career path. I mean, that's like, when I joined the military, thank God I joined the military, because I was a total knucklehead. You know, I had all this energy, all this anger, all this angst, all this hype, hyper activity in my brain, and I, I just wanted to be some kind of commando. Thank God, 
Because then as soon as I joined the Navy, they're like, you got to do this. I'm like, cool. I put all my energy in that one thing. So for you to open up those doors for, for kids to put their, their energy in the right direction, in a positive direction, that's awesome. And, and yeah, I mean, you know, a lot of times people will say, oh, I wish I had this book when I was younger. I do too. I wish I had all those books when I was younger too. They would have made my whole life a lot easier. And I, I'm happy I was able to capture those lessons and, and get them out there. And, and I'm still learning, believe me. I'm not sitting up here saying, oh, I'll, I'll tell you how to do everything. No, I learn all the time. I learn and I make mistakes. So, and when I make mistakes, I usually try and write them down and, and tell everyone what I did and how stupid it was. And you shouldn't do what I did. So I appreciate that feedback, that's awesome. And, and thanks for your service, both in the military and what you're doing now in the civilian sector. I mean, building a business, America, America is, powerful because of our economy. So every time you go out and you build a business and you hire people, you employ people, you produce something, that's, that's your new, that's the way, that's a patriotic thing to do. So thanks for your service on both sides. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so the question was, his experience in Vietnam was Dick Marcinko showed up in his camp. And, and I'm sure he wasn't bringing flowers. <laughs> and what, what was that? He was barefoot. And he was barefoot, there you go. <laughs> and I was lucky enough when I got to SEAL Team, they told us to run barefoot because the first thing that v, the VC would do if they captured you was take your boots. So they say, you gotta have tough feet. And I was like, like I said, I thought I was going to Nam anyway, so all that did was add fuel to the fire. Uh, and then how did SEALs de evolve from there and then into where we are now and where they're going in the future? You know, I, I don't know if you know this, but after Vietnam, they actually completely downsized the SEAL teams to the point where they took guys from the SEAL teams and sent them to the regular Navy fleet, which this is, this is the worst thing about the Navy. The worst thing about the Navy about being in the SEAL teams is, first of all, you, have, you don't have this good kind of solid infantry background, which you get in the Army and the Marine Corps, because the Navy doesn't have an infantry. But if you don't make it through SEAL training, guess what you do? You go to a ship, which people that want to be SEALs don't want to be on a ship. At least if you don't make it through SF training, you can go be a soldier, you know, you can be an infantry soldier. That's still cool. So the SEALs, when, they, when, when Vietnam ended, they, they really downsized the SEAL teams a lot. They sent guys back to the fleet, and man, it was dry years. And the SEALs are the redheaded stepchild of the Navy. At least they used to be, right? They used to be. They, they had no, we, you know, we didn't have any admirals. We didn't have any flag officers. There's no flag officer SEALs. That didn't happen until like my generation. So the funding wasn't there. The equipment wasn't there. The manning was barely there, and it was just sort of this group of, I mean, the closest way to put it, you know, I, I think sometimes you can be an outside group, maybe you're like the Boy Scouts inside the Army or the, the Boy Scouts inside the Marine Corps, but we were like the Hells Angels inside the Navy, like not exactly uh, loved. And luckily, we made it through those years in between Vietnam and the first Gulf War, the first Gulf War, Again, that, that war was over in 72 hours. Um, SEALs played a very minor role in doing some beach reconnaissance and setting off some decoys to make Saddam think that we were attacking one way when we were really attacking from another location. And I think we just, hang, we just hung on. We just really hung on. We, you know, when I got to SEAL Team 1, I got is issued the damn web belt and the H gear from Vietnam. That's, that's what we got issued. Uh, we got issued the, the what they call them, coral booties. Coral booties that were from like Korea. So we were just lucky to be able to hang on. And I think once, once September 11th came, um, all of a sudden we started getting money. But here's where I think SEALs have done, here's kind of why and I think what has caused SEALs to, to do well. Because we were always kind of the redheaded stepchild, we didn't have funding, we didn't have money, we didn't have doctrine. We had no doctrine. 
When I got to SEAL Team 1, there was zero doctrine, zero. If you wanted to know how to assault a building, it was gonna to get told to you by someone that was older than you. That's the only information that we had. There was nothing written down. And in the Army, in the Marine Corps, everything, you have doctrine for everything. Which is, which is it's a huge advantage. Because if I'm a new lieutenant, and I don't know how to do a raid, I can literally open up a book and, and read on how to do a raid, what jobs are gonna be assigned, what method we should use, how, how we should brief this thing, it's all in there. The SEALs have none of that. So it's a huge advantage for the Army and the Marine Corps that they have all this doctrine. The SEALs, we don't have that. But here's where it becomes an advantage. We basically get good at figuring things out. We end up with very open minds. We end up with, with coming up with new ideas on how to solve problems, and it becomes a, it, be, it becomes an advantage. There still are parts of it that are a disadvantage, but it becomes, part of it becomes an advantage as well. The other thing is the water. The water, working in the water, sucks. It sucks. It not just sucks because it's cold and miserable, but your equipment gets ruined, your radios flood, your weapons get destroyed. It's a total nightmare working in the water. And so in order to do your job, you are constantly punished just for being a SEAL. Your, your weapon's getting rusted, your radius, like all these things are happening every time. That's just to go on the op. And so you have to work together. Oh, underwater, by the way, you can't talk to each other. You have to pre-plan, you have to actually know what you're gonna do. Anytime you're working in the water, you can die. Like if you, you make a mistake in the water, you drown. You make a mistake on land, you fall down. You lay there for a little while and then you get back up again. So I think the idea of working in the water all the time made us, made us, made us plan more and made us very tight as a unit. And that, and I think the open minds, by the time September 11th came, we, we, we were ready to look at the new mission set and, and figure it out. And I'll give you an example. I was, my platoon got to Baghdad. When, when we deployed, we had never driven Humvees before. We never even done freaking mounted operations before. Never. <laughs> and all of a sudden we get there and we get a turnover from the guys that were there from SEAL Team 5. They're like, hey, here's how you do this. Here's the patrol formation. They're just telling us what to do. Here's what you gotta look out for. Here's how we set up the vehicles. And, and we were like, okay, cool. And we're driving around Baghdad International Airport learning how to do a patrol on vehicles. A and that's what we did. And then we ended up doing hundreds of operations, vehicle mounted operations. I, I led hundreds of vehicle mounted operations. And we did really well at it. And by the time we were done, we were fantastic. We were great. So I think that, that open mind and adaptability and then trying to grab those lessons and pass them on whenever we can, I think that was very beneficial to us. I think that for as far as the future goes, the word is that we're going back to the water, right? That, that we are going back, seals are starting to go back towards the water. Meaning, hey, we've been fighting in the desert and the mountains for 20 years. Um, let's make sure we maintain that capability of the hinterland, the water, the high water line, make sure that we can handle those operations in there, which we can. Um, you know, guys used to say, we need to still do water operations every, you know, every month. And I said, hey, if you took a SEAL platoon and took them out of the water for five years, put them back in the water, in two weeks they'd have everything figured out again. They'd figure it out. <laughs> so where we're gonna go in the future, I think depends on what the future brings. And I think that one of the best things that the SEALs bring to the battlefield is open mind and adaptability. And I think whatever, wherever there's a gap, wherever there's a, a need, the SEALs will be able to fill it in. And one of those examples is uh, the security details that were run for the top seven leaders of the Iraqi government in Iraq in 2004, 2005. There was seven uh, provincial leaders Gov or what, interim government leaders, and everybody in Iraq wanted to kill them, and they needed to be kept alive. And no one wanted that mission. 
including the SEALs. But the SEALs got that mission, no fail mission. Hey, this is what you're gonna do. And they said, okay, how do we keep these guys safe? And they figured it out. So I think we'll be able to adapt and whatever comes our way, that's what we'll end up doing. Make sense? Yeah, we will. Airborne. We don't know where it's gonna end up. Yes? parallels there. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of parallels, a lot of lessons to learn from one and the other. Yeah, a friend of mine just wrote a great book. Um, it's called, it's got a horrible title. No offense to my friend, the author, but it's called By Water Beneath the Walls, which references some old attack on some city in 800 AD or something like this. But what it, it talks about he was a SEAL, and at one point, his grandmother had asked him, how come the SEALs are commandos? How come the SEALs are commandos? How come the Navy has this commando force? Why do you have that? Why don't the Marine Corps do it? That makes a lot more sense. The Army, why doesn't the Army have this commando force? Well, they do kind of, but he talks about all these incidences that took place over the years, and a lot of times, it's exactly what you're talking about. Conventional military would go, oh, you know what? We don't want these special forces guys running around, downsize them. And then the Navy would go, we need some special forces. I guess we gotta make our own. So you're right, the, the Army sometimes hold back the, the special operations. The Marine Corps, when I joined the Navy, the Marine Corps attitude was, we don't need special operations in the Marine Corps because we're all special operations. Does any, you remember that? Oh yeah. Yeah, so we were like, Okay, I guess we'll be the guys in the water. So, but, but now I think it's becoming, it's become, not even becoming, it's become clear that having special operations forces is absolutely mandatory and should be focused on. I mean, they're, they're trying to make a little less SEALs right now than they were five years ago but there's no one that's considering sending any current SEALs to the fleet because the force is too big. That's not gonna happen again. What else? Yes? I just switched from flip phone to smartphone. I guess it's now uh, podcast, so how do you find the smaller video? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever seen a YouTube video before? Okay, if you go on YouTube, and you type in J-O-C-K-O, -O, which is my name, Jocko, and then podcast, it'll be there. And you can watch them all there. And uh, yeah, if you, what kind of phone do you have? An iPhone. An iPhone? There's an app on the iPhone. <laughs> it's called Podcasts. <laughs> and if you press that, it'll open up, and then there's a little magnifying glass, which means search. Press that. And then type Jocko, and you'll be there. <laughs> it's weird. When I, started, when I started my podcast, which was 2015, it was like 17% of America was listening to podcasts, and now it's like 87%. So it's, it's an incredible. What people like about podcasts is you can mow the lawn and listen to a podcast. You can do the dishes and listen to a podcast. You can, you can do all kinds of act. You can drive and listen to a podcast. Whereas all these, the reading, you can't read and drive, certainly. So, yeah, not supposed to anyways. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, ask your grandkid and they'll tell you. We had a question, yes?
Well, I appreciate Amen. it. Amen. Yeah, it's real. Um, so I've written some kids' books, and I realized this. I think my first kids' book came out in 2015 or 2016. And by 2018, when I'd go to my kids, I have four kids, when I'd go to their wrestling tournaments, little kids would come up to me, little 13, 14-year-old kids, and say, I started wrestling because of your book. And now when I go talk to military units, <laughs> a lot of those kids that are now 19, 20, 21, 22, are, they tell me, hey, you know, I joined the military. They're not saying because of me, but you know, I, got, I, I started exploring this possibility because of listening to your podcast, because they heard tilt. And they say, I want to be a Green Beret. <laughs> yes? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nicely done. And you turned it back on again. Thank you. <laughs> well, um, I've had a bunch of people on my podcast. I mean, I have veterans on my podcast all the time, and the young, the young veterans, whatever they're doing, I'm backing them. Um, and as far as sponsors, nope. I don't, I, don't, I don't have any sponsors. I don't want somebody telling me what I can and can't talk about. I don't want somebody telling me that my podcast is too long or too short. I don't want them to come back and say I offended somebody, so they're not going to give me their money. Um, this is America. <laughs> but I appreciate the offer. Yes? Yep, we do. We've made progress. In fact, the last thing I was doing as I was leaving the SEAL teams was putting together the leadership doctrine. And that was kind of the first draft of the first book that I wrote, Extreme Ownership. So that is, went into, hey, here's how you lead a, a, a SEAL platoon. Here's how you lead a SEAL task unit. Cover, move, simple, prioritize and execute, decentralize command, take extreme ownership of what's happening. These are things that I was lucky enough to be able to get in there. But they definitely did better with doctrine. Um, as time went on, and now you've got the big support of SOCOM and the Lessons Learned Center. It's, 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 it's a lot better. It's a lot better than it was. And I still think that SEALs maintain a decent amount of their open mind and their flexibility just because of, um, I don't think anything is so tight in the doctrine that there's not room for guys to use their imagination. Yes? Uh, with the guys we almost, uh, we, I went on pre-deployment and worked with the Iraqi counterterrorism, or was it ICTF? So that's, that's where I worked. Have they developed? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So I wasn't sure if you answered that correctly. If there were a bunch of Al Talibani who would be like the president in 2004, obviously they wouldn't want it. I was just curious if you had done any uh, podcasts or information training about being able to work with these groups that we developed and helping Yep, no, I, I didn't, I didn't, um, I haven't done any podcasts like that. Um, I mentioned it, or I had some of the guys that were in like the Battle of Missoula that were up there with the, what became, those, those were kind of the remnants, in the, or I, I should say the line of the ICTF kind of became that group and they went up and fought in Missoula very hard, which was very impressive because the Iraqis that we fought with in, in Ramadi were, were not of the highest quality. And some of them were good, but a lot of them, I mean, we had a whole battalion leave the battlefield and never come back. I mean, a whole battalion, if you can imagine that. We had companies and platoons, yes, but a whole battalion leave because they got attacked and not come back, that was, uh, that was not good for morale. Uh, but 
the, some of those troops that you guys work with, had planted that seed, eventually grew up and became the, 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 the troops that went into Missoula and did a fantastic job and took incredible levels of casualties. So that was impressive that they stayed and fought. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, uh, when I was in Ramadi, we were under the uh, 10th Mountain, and it was, or sorry, not 10th Mountain, 10th Special Force Group, General Tobo, Colonel Tobo at the time, he was just freaking outstanding. Just an outstanding guy, gave us total support. Um, when things went wrong, he supported us. When thing went, things went right, he supported us. He was just an outstanding guy. I just loved working for him. Yeah, outstanding. What an outstanding guy. What else? Yes. Yep, that's what I do. That's what, so I have a company, it's called Echelon Front. I've had it, I think we incorporated it in 2012. And we've been teaching, and I've worked with literally every industry that there is, from energy to finance to manufacturing, um, hardware, software, just healthcare, everything. We work with every organization, and you're right, there is there is not a lot, there, there, there's the reason why that this company has grown so much because that, that information about leadership is so important. And look, it's the same in the military. You know, the military has a, has a pretty tight window and so you get, sort of, you get sort of a standard leader that you're gonna get, but everyone that, who in here has been in the military worked for an idiot, right? <laughs> So, so it's not like the military knows how to teach people how to lead. It does okay, and we get some great leaders. You know, I go and talk to the West Point, I go talk to the Naval Academy, talk to ROTC students, talk to OCS students. Like, where does the best officers come from? It actually doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's who that person is that really makes a difference and what they absorb as far as leadership. Now, what's interesting about that is what that kind of indicates is that indicates, well, it's kind of like who you are, you're either a good leader or you're not. But that's actually not true. It's actually not true, and I got to see that over and over again because I put platoon after platoon after platoon after platoon after platoon through training. And if I had a, a SEAL that was a bad leader, nine times out of 10, I'd be able to get that guy to see the light. And he would say, oh yeah, I, I didn't think of that. Or, oh, I guess I shouldn't try and make every decision myself. Or, oh, maybe I should involve my guys in the planning. Nine times out of 10, they, you could teach them the skill of leadership. One time out of 10, you'd have to fire the guy. He's too arrogant, big ego, you can't teach him anything, doesn't want to hear anything, and he, you just got to get rid of him. And we would do that. We would do that. Every SEAL team that we'd put through, we'd probably fire one, two, or three SEAL leaders from that SEAL team. But the idea that, oh, you can't teach leadership, you can teach it. You can teach it. And there's actually specific skills that you can learn that will make you a better leader. Um, how about listening? Try that one. Right? <laughs> we get a lot of leaders where they think, oh, well, I'm a leader, so you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to sit up here and I'm going to talk and I'm going to tell everyone what to do. Well, how does that feel? All you have to do is remember what it was like when you were a subordinate and your platoon commander came in and started telling you, hey, you're gonna do this, 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 here's how we're gonna execute, here's the plan, and now shut up and go do it. How did that make you feel? Makes you go, hmm, this, this, I would do it a different way. Oh, so I'm looking at my boss saying, I would do this a little bit different. So now what does that do to my attitude when we're in the field? Ah, oh, you see, boss, you didn't think of this, did you? Idiot. <laughs> so instead, a good leader walks in and says, hey, Till, hey, here's the mission. How do you think we should do it? And then I listen. And what are the chances that Till, who's got a bunch of experience, comes up with a freaking good plan? Chances are pretty good. And if he comes up with some plan that doesn't make much sense, all I have to do is ask him a couple questions. Hey, Till, do you think it makes sense to, 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 to leave this big piece of high ground right here exposed? And don't you think the enemy might take that? He goes, no, we're going to take that too. Oh, OK, so I just asked him a question. He came up with a new idea to solve that problem. So there's all these things that we can do as leaders. These are skills. Asking good questions, earnest questions, listening to what your team has to say. 
But this is another one. If Tilt comes to me with a plan and he's working for me, as long as it's a viable plan, I'm going with it. I'm going with it. Sounds good. Sounds good, Tilt. Let's go with it. I don't say, well, I'd like to actually go, you know, this, this route, which is another quarter, uh, quarter, another 400 meters to the west. As if I know where the enemy's going to be. No one knows where the enemy's going to be. But him and I are going to now argue about where the enemy's going to be? We don't know. And by the way, if I have to argue with him, then how convincing am I with my information? I'm not very convincing which means my information it probably isn't that good, which means I'm using a bunch of leadership capital just to try and get to satisfy my ego, which is we're doing it my way. So yes, there's all kinds of problems in leadership, <laughs> in the military, in the civilian world, and I get to, to teach it all day long, and I got a bunch of guys that work for me in the military that are now on the team. How are we doing? Anybody got anything else before I... Rap. By rap, I just mean end. Yeah. <laughs> you won't be hearing any rapping from me. Well, once again, Tilt, thank you so much for bringing me. Um, thank you. It truly is an honor for me to stand up here. You, you guys are my heroes. I'm the way that my whole life is based on the fact that you all went out, did your job, earned this reputation, and it's an honor for me to be able to talk to you. And I, I appreciate being here and appreciate everything that you've done for me and, most important, everything that you all have done for the United States of America. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doc. And before he gets off the stage, we want to present, you know, John Joyce has, is the director for the SFA reunion this year. And John's worked two years on this, including working with Jocko more than a year ago to get Jocko to appear here today, because that schedule his, I know how tight it is. <laughs> it took us eight months to get together. <laughs> so a little swag from us, sir. Uh, John's company builds the coins and also metal tags for the car. We have a crest that you might recognize, sir, a Navy crest. And because you've had POWs as from our Vietnam War, we still have today 1,584 POWs and MIAs in Southeast Asia from the Vietnam War. We have a joint SOA, SFA, POW, MIA committee with a coin we're going to present today. And of course, a little mug. We know you don't drink coffee or tea or whatever it is, but your energy drinks, maybe you pour one in here. But this is from us to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Phil. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>